everyone. For those of you who don't know me, my name's Janelle. For everybody else who's been watching for a while, hey, welcome back. This week is the final piece of the puzzle in the mini-series that I've written on uh, Agile Organization Transformation. So we've been through the first five principles, um, looking outside in from a customer's perspective, embracing variation, doing the work and improving the work is the work. We've looked at changing the uh, performance incentives and we've looked at shifting the philosophy of measurement. Today's episode is all about changing finance practices. And when I say finance practices, it's actually bigger than that. This is about reinventing the technology of management. Uh, but there's a reason that, that, I, that I call this principle change financial practices. And that is because if we can get to the core of what's driving the organization, then the rest of the momentum and the change starts to happen. And if you can get to finance, uh, then that's a really good place to start to streamline the rest of your organization because people got to come to you for money. So if they come to you for money in the right way, then we're starting to set up the environment in which the rest of our organization can run. So what does that look like? Well, it could be as simple as changing some of your investment decision processes. The reality is that we're not set up with today's financial practices to enable iterative design, to enable teams to test and learn, to enable that culture of continuous learning. Now, it doesn't mean that that doesn't happen in today's organizations. It simply means that the financial practices that we've got in place don't encourage that type of behavior in a really authentic way. Um, you can still use these behaviors within the existing models, but it's tough and it's hard and people have learned to do it a different way. And so actually by changing up the way that we utilize these financial practices, then we're able to start to shift the way that we work. So it could be as simple as changing the types of questions that you ask in an investment decision. I had one finance partner that came on board with a client who uh, they were, they'd been going through this change for a little while and they were looking to set something new up. And this person, for whatever reason, just jumped on board with what we were trying to do. And she was great. She got stuck straight in and within about a day's worth of workshopping what this thing could look like, um, she had figured out that all she needed to do, rather than go and change the entire financial practice to start with, first thing she could do was ask one slightly different question for anybody that was coming to her for a project for money. And so instead of asking for $50,000 to do, go and do a solution design and write a business case to do this particular project, she said, well, how about if I turn it around and I say to these people, I'm not going to give you 50 grand to go and do that, but I will give you $50,000 to go and demonstrate to me that your idea works. And so that by that simple change she was able to utilize the existing practice and start to embed some of these principles around test and learn and experimentation and making decisions based on data sets rather than our historic practice of going away and trying to get all of those answers up front before we come back and then ask for the money to go and do that project. So it was one really simple way. Now, when you get to the other end of the of the spectrum, you find people uh, who are doing things like beyond budgeting, where you're doing bottom-up budgeting, you're doing negotiation across company to try and start to understand where our budgets should be. And we're making decisions as a collective about where to strategically invest the money of the company. Um, now, that's, that's at the other end of the extreme. But in any case, you've got to change these financial practices. And then the flip side of that is that if we are able to find those tools where we can actually enhance and make the finance team's life easier, as well as making our own life easier, then all of a sudden, that's the magic source, right? And I know there's at least eight to 10 people in my network who will remember the story of sitting down with an IT uh, group who were trying to go through uh, reducing the amount of work in progress, or WIP, as the accounting um, team call it, in a particular portfolio. Now we're talking hundreds of millions of dollars and we're talking about a, an open uh, financial process that means that we actually have an impact on our balance sheet um, and we're, we're having an impact on what the financials look like at the end of year. Now particularly important for publicly listed companies but equally important for companies that aren't publicly listed that are wanting to go through and do that financial due diligence. You don't want a whole bunch of open projects that are uncapitalized, sitting on your books. It's just not 
great in terms of financial practice. And so this team had sat down and they'd worked through the spreadsheet and um, we'd, we'd sort of hit a few roadblocks because a lot of the stuff that was uh, large sums of money. So initially we'd streamlined the list and said, what's the biggest sum of work in progress? What's the biggest amount of WIP that's open? And let's go after those projects. And so we'd had these conversations, but we'd sort of had a bit of a roadblock because this team had a huge uh, hardware program that was um, that was in progress. And so a lot of the WIP was actually validly open, um, but also it was for these big kind of hardware projects. It wasn't for software build and those sorts of things that we could capitalize quickly. So we've been through this process and after about an hour, we sort of said to the team, okay, cool. So <clears throat> we've looked at it this way. How about we flip the list? And what we did was we chose to sort based on aged WIP. So anything that was open for more than six months. Now, when you're running a large portfolio of work in the order of hundreds of millions of dollars and you're trying to implement agile best practice and you're trying to implement these iterative ways of working, these test and learn cycles, what you're looking to do is bring down that cycle time, right? But if you're in a large enterprise, it doesn't necessarily mean that you're going to get to two weekly cycles. What it often means, though, is that you're not doing three to four year projects anymore, but you should be able to get to a place where you're doing projects within a year or in this case, within six months, I would even argue within three months. So I would argue that for large enterprise, if you've got WIP that's greater than three months old, definitely if you've got WIP that's greater than six months old, then you're not doing your job in terms of implementing agile best practice. And so we said this to the CFO. We said, let's take a look at everything that's over six months. And lo and behold, there was this huge mass of projects that had WIP that had been open more than six months. And at that point, both the CIO and the CFO are very aligned because we're clearly, if, if that's your project that's open for more than six months, we're clearly not building in a test and learn cycle. We've clearly got long cycle work going on. We're not closing stuff off. We're not capitalizing the asset. We're not delivering the value to customers. We're not delivering the benefits to the business. And all of a sudden we have this list of projects that we can go after and say, hey, come on, let's sort this out. And so that looks like actually a bit of a tag team around how do we get that team set up so that they can close work out more quickly and that they're actually completing what they're starting, they're learning from it, they're feeding that back into their ongoing backlog and their ongoing program of work. So it works both ways, right? This isn't just about taking away a bunch of uh, tools from the finance team and saying, we're agile now, we don't do that. It's about the give and take. And so in that example of work in progress, you've got an option where, hey, actually, if we're doing the right thing, it's the right thing for both of those teams. So that's what I'm talking about when I'm saying we need to change the way that we do our financial practices, whether it be the investment decisions on the front end, we need to get rid of those big, clunky, old methods that we've used to approve and to start work in the past. We've gone after business cases again. Um, and on the back end, we need to actually make sure that we're backing it up with the financial processes that close out the work as it's happening iteratively. It's going to give us a healthier balance sheet overall as well. So that was what I wanted to share today. If you've got any questions, any comments, hit me up below. Send me an email. I'd love to hear from you. And uh, yeah, I hope that was helpful. We've, we've done the six series. If you've got questions about anything that's going on within those six principles, let me know. These are the core of the values and the, the principles that I bring to Agile Org Transformation. This underpins everything. Every tool set that we use on top, we're always thinking about these six principles. Outside in from a customer's perspective. Embracing variation. Improving the work and doing the work is the work. Changing the performance incentives shifting the philosophy of measurement, and changing the financial and management practices that go along with it. So I hope that's been super useful. Uh, and I also hope that wherever you are in the world today, you're having an awesome, awesome day. And uh, we'll see you again next week. Thanks.